Welcome to our Maker Jam Lunchtime Lab session. My name is Susie O'Hara and I'm the project manager and curator of One Cell at a Time, a public engagement program for the Human Cell Atlas here in the UK. Our Maker Jam lunch, Lunchtime Lab sessions offers you a chance to meet members of the Human Cell Atlas community who are directly involved in shaping the future of our healthcare and to learn more about the research that ha that's happening at the moment in labs across the UK. But before we begin, I'd like to just um, take a moment to note that we have closed captions available for anybody who requires it. So if you look to the bottom of your screen and click on the closed captions button, you'll be able to um, uh, activate that for yourself. And the second thing is that we're um, using the chat function for any questions or ideas or links that you may want to share during the event. So please feel free to use this throughout the session this lunchtime. So without further ado, I'm really delighted to welcome colleagues from the European Bioinformatics Institute who are joining us today to, serve, to share their research and their work with you. The European Bioinformatics Institute, also known as EMBL, EBI, um, is a global leader in the storage analysis and dissemination of large bioinformatic, uh, sorry, large biological data sets. They help scientists realize the potential of big data in an, by enhancing their ability to exploit complex information to make discoveries that benefit humankind. The Institute is at the very forefront of computational biology research with work spanning sequence analysis methods, multidimensional statistical analysis and data-driven biological discovery for plant biology to mammalian development and disease. EMBL EBI is part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, which is a non-for-profit international organization with six sites located across Europe. It's located on the Wellcome Genome Campus near Cambridge in the UK, and it's one of the largest concentrations of scientific and technological expertise in genomics. EBI have a number of colleagues across different teams working on the Human Cell Atlas, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome them all here today. Thank you for joining us. And each speaker will have 10 minutes to share their work, and these talks will then be followed by about 15 minutes or so um, of a Q&A session for any questions that you may want to ask them. And so without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Wei Keng Te to take the screen for his talk. Take it away, Wei. Thanks very much for that great introduction, uh, Susie. I'm just gonna briefly share my screen. Cool. Um, you should be able to see this slide um, now. Cool, thumbs up from Susie, great. Uh, excellent, so I'm just gonna briefly discuss um, the Human Cell Atlas and sort of where we are at. Um, and I, I'm not sure how much of an overview people already have of the Human Cell Atlas, but I'll just be giving a, a very brief description of the project and what I as a data angler personally do. Um, as I'm sure most people know, the HCA, the Human Cell Atlas, is a global research initiative. We're open to taking single cell expression data from all across um, the world. I'm going to be briefly discussing our metadata schema and how and what we do in taking data through the data lifecycle. So our community, the Human Cell Atlas, is devoted to gathering and connecting and standardizing single cell expression data, which is a, a specific type of data which looks at RNA, um, at, at gene expression. So it's sort of, I've, I've described it to some of my friends as the, the human genome project, but sort of slightly more detailed in that it's looking at RNA instead of DNA. In our community, we have experimental researchers, we've got computational researchers, and we've got engineers and tool developers, and all of these different people work together to focus their efforts on building this huge store of data, which will be able to create loads of different connections and just 
added data from places which have previously been siloed and locked away in smaller databases across and around the world. As a data wrangler, my primary mission is to support data generators sharing their data with the HCA community and to ensure that the data shared via the HCA data coordination portal is fair. With the HCA community, we've got people and labs working from all across the world. We've got publications from the States, we've got many in the UK, we've got some in Australia, some from different places in Asia, such as China um, and all across the world. We have a, science is a global project and it's a, a global effort and there is so much scientific development that is going on all across the world and sharing that data to avoid duplicating data or avoid duplicating effort is one of the best ways of increasing and facilitating the speed that scientific research goes to. And I'm going to briefly touch on the second point about what it means to have data, which is FAIR. Um, FAIR basically means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. These are the data principles that govern how we want to store data as part of the Human Cell Atlas data coordination platform, but also how we want to present it. Your data isn't very, very helpful to the rest of the world if they can't find it. Your data isn't you know, very helpful to other researchers if there's no way for them to come on and gain access to it, whether it's by a managed access route, where it's you know, data that might be publicly identifiable and you have to go through some more by different walls to get to that data, whether it's completely open access data that anyone can download freely and use for furthering scientific research. We want to make sure it's interoperable. Can it be analyzed in a programmatic way? Can you type in specific search queries and obtain the data that you want to get? And also reusability and reliability. Is it reusable data? Is this data that you know how it was produced? Can you then check its reliability? Can you take that data and use it in your own scientific work and use that as a base, as a foundation to springboard and build on in order to further your own scientific research? So these are the sort of core data principles that we have whenever we're making any decision really about our metadata schema or about how we are storing obtaining and in the end presenting and sharing data with the rest of the community. I'm gonna sort of take a couple of steps back and briefly describe um, what metadata is. Uh, metadata is the data about the data. This gets very matrix very quickly. Um, structured information that describes, explains, locates, or makes it easier to retrieve views or manage an information resource. The easiest way for me to describe this is to give examples. So let's say my data is a specific set of DNA sequences. And then the metadata about that could be, you know, who was this taken from? Like, you know, what was their age? What was their gender? Like, what was their blood type? Um, how, what was the way in which we collected the sample from this person? When did we collect the sample from this person? Like what, what machine was used in order to process this sample in a bunch of different ways? All of this is very, very useful, almost, da data is almost, I don't wanna be too drastic, but it's almost useless without the accompanying sample metadata and many ways because it it links into that reusability and interoperability in which you have to know how it was created in order for it to be useful. Perhaps you've got a PhD student who wants to find you know a large list of data from a database where they're only looking at patients who have a specific drinking history and have a specific blood type. Without the metadata, they can't filter in that way. They can't decide what's important to them and what's relevant to them and filter the rest of this out. Having a strong metadata schema and also a large amount of metadata helps with that in a lot of different ways. And 
going to briefly touch on the impact. Um, I've been discussing metadata standards and sort of metadata schema in um, and holding in very high importance. And so the reason is that, unfortunately, what a lot of data scientists spend their time doing is simply cleaning and organizing data. The Human Cell Atlas has a bunch of different purposes, being this huge, wonderful sort of store of single cell expression data. And it's you know, useful for creating connections between different data, which I'll touch on briefly. But also, it's hopefully, it, it is a wonderful time saving resource. I know many of my you know, colleagues and PhD friends who have mentioned this would have been so useful when I was doing you know, my own scientific research. They can spend up to like you know a year, a year and a half of their PhD sort of trawling through papers, looking for the papers which are specifically relevant to them. I have to read through you know eighty, a hundred different papers, and from those papers, look in the appendixes and like extract out the specific bits of information that I want. Whereas you know having a database with good metadata standards with a high amount and quality of metadata means that you can just go there, type in the blood type you're looking for, or type in the cell type you're looking for, or which organ you're interested in. And there's that huge store of data available and metadata as well, if you want to refine your search in a more specific way. So in that case, that's sort of the case for metadata. It allows you to discover new data, compare and combine different data sets. And also in the case of, of gene expression matrices, annotate cells and clusters. So we want to reduce that 60% of time that scientists are spending cleaning and organizing data. We want to reduce that and allow much more of that time for doing actual science. So the HCA metadata standard um, is something that has been evolving over time and something that evolves together with the needs of the community. We want it to be useful not only for the human cell atlas, but also for single cell expression data in general and beyond. Having a set way in which you can describe, process, and label your data could be really, really useful for a, a wide community that you know, every single lab has their own way of performing the protocol. Every single lab has their slightly different ways of like what they write on the sticky labels that they put onto their reagents. And standardizing it is really, really important for the reasons I mentioned before, because if you standardize all of it, then you're able to filter through it much more efficiently. You're also able to search through it and obtain the data that you want. There's also a brief um, discussion on ontologies that I'm going to skip past here for, but um, if anyone has any ontologies questions, feel free to ask them later. And that's where we are with the HCA metadata standard. We work with the community to create the standard, you know, what's missing from our metadata standard, what information would you like to store? Um, perhaps, you know, the, the brain community comes to us and says, oh, actually, this bit of information is really, really useful for our research. Like we want to be able to capture this specifically and filter through it. We'll take that on board, we'll speak to them and we'll you know, prioritize making that in a list of different updates that we are trying to make. So there's always evolving technologies as well and you know, new technologies are coming up all the time and we've also been evolving our own schema to keep up with that specific site seek or new um, expression technologies. So that's sort of the the first part of what wranglers do, um, which is working with the metadata schema um, and the metadata standard and trying to make that as accessible and as useful to the wider scientific community, not just the DCP. Um, and I'll briefly talk about the other part, which is data, the data life cycle, which is where we get data from other people or we go out and grab yeah. data. So we, we discover projects single cell expression projects, some of them from labs coming to us saying, let's put it on the DCP and some of them from us trawling through the publications just generally out in papers. We check if they meet our specific requirements for meeting the fair data principles for you know, which organs and which species they come from and also whether or not they, you know, 
are useful and where we prioritize what we are trying to rank for first. Um, we try and develop sort of a as diverse and holistic data set as possible. So there's always groups which are underrepresented in data research and we try and prioritize those, whether they are you know, groups which are less in research in ethnicity or in geographical location or even you know, in gender or sexuality, asexual, trans, non-binary people for very good reasons you know, are, are more wary of signing up to scientific studies, but like creating this holistic data set in of diverse cell types in, in many, many different ways is really important. Um, Thank you, Wei. We need to wrap up now. Okay, uh, cool. I'll, I'll sort of leave that there. Um, and yeah. Um, and uh, I'll briefly, no, next, the next person to be speaking is Jacob, who works on the same team as I do, but is a tool developer and software developer. Hi, thanks, Wei. Sorry, I couldn't find the button. Um, I will just present my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. So yeah, as Wei said, I am a software developer for the Human Cell Atlas Data Coordination Platform. So I work very closely with Wei and other wranglers um, to build the tools and the infrastructure that support the submission of this these vast amounts of data as well as as facilitating making that we make sure the data is fair and uh, findable accessible interoperable and reusable that right Wei spoke about um, yeah so just a bit about how I got here. Um, I studied my bachelor's degree in the Maastricht Science Program in the Netherlands, um, mostly molecular and cell biology with a bit of mathematics. And for my bachelor thesis, I was introduced to bioinformatics by my uh, supervisor, Egon Willehagen. Um, I had never really heard of bioinformatics before, but I really enjoyed programming and biology but not so much the wet lab. So it was a nice, um, a, re a really happy coincidence that I was sort of introduced to bioinformatics. Um, so I, I continued my work from there to work for, to, for a Google Summer of Code internship. Uh, I was working on, on wiki pathways, some tooling for, for uh, that platform. And then following that, I worked as a UI developer at Abcam in also in Cambridge. Um, for a bit over a year and then decided to do a research master's in Barcelona at the uh, CRG um, was working on um, RNA sequencing data analysis pipelines and now I am here following a master's working at the DCP very happily. So this is the the front page of the RUI for the data coordination platform. The aim of this UI is that a contributor can go in, immediately register, uh, log, re register and log in and start registering a, their project. And with help from Wranglers to upload all of their data for their project, upload all of their metadata, ensure that the metadata conforms to our standards and then finally go on to submit the data once it's all valid and it, and they are happy for it to, for it to be exported to the human cell atlas. Um, there's quite a lot of different technologies that go into this, but because we have to validate all of the data, have to ensure that it conforms to our standards, and yeah, there's, there's quite a, a lot going in. Um, we use a lot of technologies day to day um, to to, to, to build this platform. A way touched on a lot on the why, um, but for, for, for me, the, the main part of my job is supporting 
the huge amounts of data that we, 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 we get, and this is, can be terabytes of data for one project. Um, so labs all over the world are collecting these huge amounts of data and we wanna make sure that it's shared and reusable. And so we, uh, my job is to, as I said, assist the wranglers in creating this platform that allows for this easy and efficient submission of data to the HCA. So way touch, touched upon uh, FAIR. For me, FAIR means making sure that the data is um, accessible by machines with very little human intervention. And in, in my case, that means making sure that data has uh, unique identifiers. Uh, so it's findable, uh, it's accessible, uh, either that it's open, openly available through an easy to access URL website, or we have set up correct authentication and authorization procedures for when data cannot be openly shared. So the technology we use day to day is, uh, this is just a snapshot of what we use where the UI that I showed earlier is based upon Angular, which is a front end JavaScript framework. And we use Python for a lot of uh, back end validation and data processing. And GitLab is one of our uh, tools to help us as developers. Um, we, it, it, it's part of our continuous integration uh, setup where we will can regularly, regularly push, push code to our central repository and it will be uh, checked and ran through our um, validation pipeline to ensure that our, we're, deli we're delivering quality production ready code that can be used, uh, can be used by our, our wranglers and our contributors. Um, Java and Spring Boot are what we've used to build our backend API. So what our Angular application communicates with. And our infrastructure is all built with Kubernetes, AWS and Helm. And these are tools that help us perform at quite a high scale with um, can be high loads of, of data and also easily scale up if needs be. Um, so yeah, that was me, a very, very short presentation, but uh, thank you very much. I will pass it on to Ilini at the, um, at, 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 uh, oh, sorry, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I will pass on to Ilini. Yeah, that was uh, totally correct. Thank you, yep. Jacob. So uh, I'm Irini, uh, Irini Papatheodoru, and I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so, um, so I suspect you can see the right version of the right side of the screen. Um, so, uh, so I'm the. Uh, Gene Expression team leader at the EBI, and uh, my team uh, develops the single cell expression atlas, uh, which I'm going to uh, talk about in this talk. Um, so basically the mission of my team is um, uh, to extract biological meaning from gene and protein expression data and make it easily available to the research community. So we, uh, up until now, we've been working with bulk uh, expression data, either from proteomics or uh, gene expression uh, technologies, and develop this uh, rich resource, the uh, expression atlas, where you can, uh, uh, you ag we aggregate data sets, we analyze them uniformly, um, we make sure the right metadata are uh, appropriately annotated with ontologies, as the previous uh, speakers uh, stressed this importance. Um, and uh, then we enable queries uh, of genes or different biological conditions across the data sets and across the species to, uh, for example, identify uh, which, uh, you know, we can query a gene such as Reg1B and see where in the human body in which tissues it is expressed. Um, and here we find, for example, that particular one is expressed highly, the dark blue, uh, consistently across experiments in pancreas. We also find from all the studies we have aggregated and reanalyzed that uh, it is also involved in pancreatic cancer. 
Um, but enough about that uh, with the uh, new technologies from single cell RNA seq um, and the kind of revolution that followed really uh, on this side. Um, we really wanted to increase the revolution of our, or the resolution of our resource as well to go from the um, tissue uh, level to the cell type and the single cell level. So, uh, I mean, I don't really have to introduce uh, why uh, single cell gene expression is uh, important to, to be done because cells is the basic unit of life and there are uh, trillions of cells. Uh, uh, that function differently and, um, oh, sorry. Uh, and also uh, it, it is important to use these techniques to um, identify as opposed to the bulk where we mash up the tissue in a, this tube and we get a signal of the gene expression from all the cells together. Uh, now we can separate them and get signal from each one of the cells and I reveal this heterogeneity and the different subpopulation and the expression variability across the different cells and their cell types. And that has a lot of applications with, uh, in different areas where the users of our resource come from, from neurobiology to germline transmission, to name a few, and embryology and so on. Um, so uh, what what we what we did was to develop uh, an integrated resource again of uh, uniformly analyzed uh, single cell RNA seq data. Um, so what we do this is a little data flow diagram of uh, the different functions in my team is to really. Uh, identify these uh, experiments from uh, single cell RNA-seq experiments from the public domain that are deposited in places such as the, um, uh, the data coordination platform of the HCA in this case, and curate them, annotate them with um, uh, ontology identifiers, and uh, then um, establish which, uh, do some quality analysis of the data, uh, select the high quality ones and then run our uniform analysis uh, pipelines on them. Then uh, the results we obtain, um, we store them on our databases and we make them an, um, easy, easily accessible and queryable through a user interface that, um, um, that uh, provides a data uh, search and also visualization. So basically, uh, we aim to, um, with the single cell expression analysis uh, resource, to enable users to discover and interpret gene expression analysis results uh, in a quick and easy way. And of course, we don't just focus on HCA, we focus on all kinds of other species, tissues, and different conditions. Um, and uh, we also help uh, and power up to disseminate projects such as uh, the Human Cell Atlas or uh, more recently the Fly Cell Atlas. So what the Single Cell Expression Atlas looks like, so this is the front page where you can perform your, um, your gene search. Um, we have um, data from 18 different species for the human cell atlas data that have been completely reanalyzed and you can query them uh, across uh, the gene expression across data sets and cell type. You can uh, click uh, basically on this link and it takes you to um, what we call the Cambridge cell atlas page, which is the dedicated um, interface to the human cell atlas. Um, we have around 217 single cell data sets and that includes over a million or 5 million cells. Um, most of our data sets are of course from human and mouse and um, uh, uh, most of the human data sets are really from the human cell atlas. Um, so my uh, previous speaker, the previous speakers hinted on this before that uh, uh, fair and uh, accurate metadata are super important for reusing these data sets because uh, this is what single cell expression atlas really does. It reuses the data sets, reanalyzes them and uh, disseminates the results. 
Um, and we worked a lot with um, uh, the wranglers of the HCA to define what is this minimum information about uh, this, to describe a single cell and a seek experiment is. Um, so, so what happens when you query uh, for a gene in a um, um, single cell expression atlas? So this is again an example where I queried for reg 1a and I, I went into a single experiment to, um, to have a look at where it is expressed. If you remember well, the bulk data sets that we uh, had gathered so far in our resource showed us that it's specifically expressed in pancreas. So here I chose a particular pancreas uh, data set. And uh, here you can see the two differ, uh, the, the typical TSNE plot that is used to represent um, uh, the results of, uh, of a single cell expression, um, a single cell RNA-seq experiment. And uh, we have the same plot uh, twice on the left-hand side. Um, we can see each dot is basically a cell and it's colored according uh, to the uh, cell type um, that it comes from. And on the right hand side, uh, each cell is colored according to the um, level of uh, the expression of this gene REG1A. And um, what a user can see here uh, quite clearly is that the, um, uh, the gene has uh, increased expression in this particular cluster, uh, which uh, corresponds to a pancreatic ICNR cell type. Um, so basically, um, we went from what we knew before that it was expressed in pancreas consistently across experiments. Now we can find out, uh, a user can find out um, using human cell atlas data sets that it's actually in one cell type that it is highly expressed. Um, so I'm not going to go very much into the detail of this, but because uh, Sylvie is going to introduce it after me and explain it, but we have another kind of visualization uh, where you can see uh, the uh, a drawing of the organ. This is the pancreas and you can uh, zoom into a particular area uh, where uh, the, uh, a sample was taken in the experiment and then uh, look at the gene expression of uh, the expression of the different genes across uh, the different cell types in that area. And here is the zoom, uh, the zoomified uh, version. And you can find that actually the gene we were interested in is a marker gene for these pancreatic case in our cells that are um, here. Um, and uh, Sylvie is working uh, on developing with our collaborators at the Sanger uh, all kinds of other anatomograms for different tissues. And uh, some of them are already available uh, through the user interface. So uh, another, uh, the last part that I would like to touch on is that really for getting this uh, meaningful uh, integrated views of the data, uh, we need to perform a standardized analysis of the raw data uh, so that they can be as comparable as possible uh, across the different studies. So um, our, uh, um, uh, the bioinformatics, um, um, the bioinformaticians in my team are very busy developing these uh, different analysis pipelines that filter the data, quantify the gene expression. They normalize them across the different um, studies, uh, remove the batch effects and so on, and cluster and detect these uh, gene markers for the different cell types. And uh, we have also uh, put this, uh, um, made these uh, workflows and the analysis tools available uh, via uh, SIAP, which is uh, our tool in uh, Galaxy, yeah, um, which we developed specifically for the human cell atlas, uh, so that anyone um, could uh, access um, this website. Um, and, um, identify data sets and redo uh, the analysis we do or with di di different uh, tools. So we have highlighted here a couple of workflows that we use specifically for the human cell atlas data 
or they could run their data set uh, using the same uh, analysis tools that uh, we used to run the HCA data sets. Um, and that's uh, really my last slide. I would like to really thank my team and our many collaborators and uh, the different communities we work with, and of course our funders. So, and now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Sylvie um, Speksova, who uh, is a curator in my team, and will talk about the anatomograms in more detail. Right. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks, Irene, for the introduction. So. Um... Let me just um, share my screen so I can start. So as um, I already said, I'm a member of a team at the Embel EBI. I'm uh, one of the curators and I am sort of in charge of this ongoing project where we develop a visualization tool for a uh, human organ single cell uh, rna seq data sets um, uh, for single cell expression atlas. So, um, as Irene already said, the single cell expression atlas is a knowledge base where we take uh, uh, data sets that are available from different databases, uh, curate them uh, to appropriate standards, uh, um, annotated ontologies, reanalyze them, and then serve the analysis results uh, in a user interface for the whole research community or anyone interested to make use of. So. Um, so apart from the uh, analyzing the data, there, there obviously uh, is uh, the additional sort of challenge of uh, serving the data sets, visualizing them in a, in a useful and engaging way. Um, and for and the standard visualization that, uh, that we use, which is widely used across the whole uh, field, is the TSNI. Uh, plots that Irene showed in her talk uh, that depicted individual clusters. But we uh, forward with uh, and uh, sort of work with our collaborators from the, mainly from the ACA um, team that it would help um, to sort of develop another uh, type of visualization tool uh, that would give our users a sort of a, a broader context um, and really help them to sort of see the cells behind the dots in each cluster and in, uh, in each plot. So, um, and that's what the anatomograms uh, really are. So uh, these are interactive diagrams, interactive anatomy diagrams that, we, that we've developed to visualize in our analytic data um, and give them sort of broader spatial and functional context. Um, to the cells that were identified with each data set. Um, technically, these are based on an SVG files, uh, so it's scalable back to graphics files, which is basically a graphics file that just describes images as a standard sort of, um, uh, format for web applications. And uh, the way we do it is that uh, our artist, um, Yana Ali Ashura, uh, creates an outline for each organ and then individual shapes um, that sort of fill the outline. Um, and each shape is uh, created specifically for each substructure, substructure of the cell type um, uh, within that image. And then we sort of layer it on top, on top of each other like a cake. Uh, uh, so, but each atomogram actually consists of uh, at least two, uh, but frequently more images that sort of depict an individual organ in increasing levels of details all the way to the uh, cellular level. So here uh, I have an example from kidney. So this would be the main, uh, the main sort of outline image, which is connected. Uh, so I don't think you're sharing your screen just to be clear, just to make sure that you know that. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. So well, that's a. I thought I did share it. So, uh, can you see it now? You can see it now. Yep. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so um, the yeah the anatomograms are basically interact interlinked uh, images and uh, interlinked interactive images. 
uh, organized into a tree where you start from the uh, whole image and then you can use the transition boxes to get to deeper levels and higher and higher level of detail for each individual organ and structure all the way down to the single cell level. Um, so yeah, this is the example from kidney, uh, but uh, we've uh, made anatomograms for quite a few other organs already, and some of them are um, already live. But um, the way the anatomograms work technically is that um, you basically start from the from the bottom image, uh, and each. Um, where each structure is annotated with an ontology ID. Uh, and that's true for all the images across uh, each individual uh, anatomogram stack. And then uh, we go to the data set and take the annotation uh, for inferred cell type, which have been ontologized during the creation process uh, so that they map to, an on to the same ontology ID. So we basically take this information uh, the, uh, the anatomogram pipeline that then uh, recognizes that this particular data point is actually uh, a photocyte or as the ontology, the correct ontology label is glomerul visceral epithelial cell. And that's this structure in the anatomogram. And then it, uh, the pipeline leverages the structure of the ontology to sort of propagate this information to the higher level images. Uh, because uh, in the ontology, the uh, protocyte is uh, a part of re renal glomerulus. So that's why in the level up image, the glomerulus will be highlighted as well. Um, and that is part of the nephron, meaning that in the top level image, you have the um, nephron shape as well. And uh, so that's how uh, the anatomograms work and propagate the information from the inferred cell types to the higher level images. Um, but um, I think it's going to be more effective to actually show people uh, rather than talk about it. So um, this is one of the anatomograms that is already live on the uh, single cell expression atlas website. Um, and it's the anatomogram for lung. As you can see, uh, because of the uh, ontology expansion that I mentioned in my previous slide, you can see that the shapes in the um, highest level, the main level image are already highlighted here. And then we can just click through the individual images uh, to get to the cellular level. Uh, and here you can, uh, you can see active sort of shapes that are grayed in. And when you hover over them, they get highlighted and you get to see the uh, the label, which unfortunately is very small, but the one I'm uh, looking at now is uh, lung ciliated cell. Um, so uh, the reason why not um, all the shapes are gray and active is because we only highlight or activate the shapes for which we actually have data in that particular data set. Um, and uh, on the left hand side, and you can then see the table that Irene also showed in her presentation, which basically gives a list of top five marker genes. So this is a way of uh, linking the cells to their uh, main markers and also sort of showing them in the context then uh, of the of the broader tissue, uh, how what structures it is part of, what uh, are its immediate neighbors. Um, and that I think uh, is really a nice way to sort of help users fully relate to the, uh, the data in each data set to the, full, to the biological complexity of the tissue behind it. Um, so uh, just uh, now when you click on that uh, thumb, thumbnail image, that's the way you have to get to back to the level up. Um, and then you can go through the, um, the uh, anatomogram tree to get to the other um, to the other images, to the other zoom lens, as we call them. And here again, we have some cell types, this is type two pneumocytes um, that have been identified in this particular data set. And you get the, and you can actually click on it, basically it sort of slightly reorganizes the, uh, 
the marketing table and now uh, uh, so that it's easier to sort of find the, uh, the the cell type that we are actually now looking at. So that's uh, that's one. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, four uh, anatomograms already live and sort of clicking on this in the cell expression atlas. One is the uh, uh, lung, as I've just shown. Uh, another is uh, another is pancreas that Irene also um, showed in her presentation. But besides these two, so we've also got uh, placenta, which is here, and uh, finally. Uh, we've got liver with uh, more sort of uh, anatomograms um, being under development and more functionality that's going to be linked to them. It's also under development and uh, going to be released soon. So thank you for um, your attention. Let me just uh, if we go back to my presentation. I would like to um, for this opportunity to acknowledge the team and the people behind this project. Um, so uh, I would mainly like to thank Yana and Yashua, who's the illustrator. So she's the one who created all these wonderful images. Um, then the whole of the uh, gene expression team, uh, in particular, our uh, uh, web developers, Alfonso and Liam, who developed the anatomogram pipeline. Our collaborators from the ontology team at the Ember EBI, and then uh, last but not least, all the uh, friendly anatomy experts that we worked with, who provided feedback and advice on getting the anatomograms anatomically as correct as possible. Okay. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Susie, you're muted. I realize I've just been on mute. <laughs> I've said all of that. And I was really just gushing about the wonderful suite of presentations that we've been treated to this lunchtime. Thank you all so very much for your time and, um, and wonderful expertise. It's been a beautiful suite of visuals that we've been treated to, I think. Um, and I'm conscious that there's some questions in the chat that have been emerging over the course of your presentations. And we'll kick off with Dominic Smith, who highlights that in the Maker Jam Discord, which I think he has shared the link for you, you're all very welcome to join um, and, and check out the creative projects that are that are happening around data and tissue donation and um, access at the moment. Something that's coming up is the idea of sonifying the data emerging from the human cell atlas um, rather than the visualization of it. And um, we're wondering, has this been done already? And if there's any thoughts by the panel in that area? Am I saying? Um, so Susie, you meant uh, harmonizing the data or? Uh... Uh, sonifying the data. So we say that again. Couldn't hear. So using maybe Dominic can. I was just about to jump in there. Yeah. Uh, to, to rather than visualize the data, to, to convert it to sound and use uh, sound as a means to understand the data by like audio. Oh, uh, like a different kind of ways to understand the data yeah. rather than uh, just visualizing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, from my side, that's not something we have um, um, really considered, um, apart from visualizing through the website. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, I, I guess the, one of the th one of the uh, interesting things about it is, um, uh, with with sound, you can often build in kind of alerts as you're exploring something to kind of draw your attention to a moment uh, or a discovery. Uh, whereas when things are laid out um, in two dimensions or in a visual way, you often have to um, scan with your eyes to find the kind of key uh, moments, the key important aspects of it. Um, I mean, it's a maker jam and there are artists, so people are thinking about using it for music and all sorts of other things as well, obviously, um, and completely using it in, for um, non-medical purposes at all. But um, I was just wondering if there's anything had been done to this point was all, yeah. 
I think it's a really interesting question because often kind of soundscapes do kind of amplify, highlight, um, you know, different dimensions of information that maybe, you know, go unnoticed by the more visual aspects. But the visual aspects have had some comments too. And uh, Dominic also suggests that with his artist head on, these are really solid illustrations done by Yana, who has done work and shared her illustrations with the One Cell at a Time broader program um, too. She's a fantastic and very generous um, illustrator. Um, Dominic suggests that these illustrations are really solid, comp compositionally balanced with weighted lines, etc. And they have an intrinsic sense of character, which pulls him in to want to investigate further. And Joanna asks, are you having to update the data on these images as you get more data? And if so, how often? Right. So first of all, thanks for the kind comments. I will pass them on to Jana. But I agree, they are really beautiful images. Um, uh, and as to the question of updates, so these are fairly, uh, this is a fairly new sort of visualization tool. So we haven't had to update them yet, uh, but we are, uh, it is part of the of the job that is definitely uh, something that we will need to happen. Um, but it is likely to be mostly on the ontology uh, level rather than the uh, having to like fully recreate the images. So it is likely that some cell types may have to be sort of uh, split into subpopulations. And uh, with the new label, or will the existing cell types will need to be renamed and relabeled accordingly? But um, I think it is less likely that we will need to uh, create. Well, we we, we are likely uh, that it's it's likely that we may need to add additional images, but I don't think it's very likely that we'll, we'll need to uh, drastically redo the existing um, images because the structures after all. Um, are already known so structurally that you know the tissue is not, not going to change it's our understanding of uh, the cell types um, that are um, that are within that changes so uh, we are obviously working with uh, a lot of anatomy experts we take uh, histology images uh, uh, photographs or microscopy images that we base these on so uh, and we do try to sort of future proof as much as possible uh, but to within some reasonable uh, boundaries. So we focus on our on structures and data, um, our structures and sort of cell types that the data sets uh, or the data are already out there for, uh, so that we actually have something to visualize. Uh, but we obviously do represent all the cell types and the uh, structures that we know are there from the, uh, from the microscopy, or the, but we don't actually necessarily have uh, the, uh, the clusters for yet. Um, so it's it's a balance, and we will need to update them. Uh, that's that's for sure. But we haven't had to yet because they're quite new. <laughs> that's the short answer. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, Jeanette Davis suggests that she loves the illustrations and slides too. So thank you again for sharing those. Um, and Jeanette's comment is. Um, that it makes her happy to hear people talking about metadata and ontologies, something that she has spent years doing in heritage and art. I wonder, Jeanette, if you had anything further to say in relation to maybe any synergies that you're, you're hearing between the two different disciplines. Jeanette is still thinking. <laughs> I'll give you some time to think, Jeanette. That's no problem at all. Um, I see a comment from, from Peace Hahi uh, relating to the sonification of the data again. Um, and he suggests that maybe the hard part of sonification is determining if it's supposed to be meaningful or just a good source for sound generation. Sound generation. And as the data changes over time, it could produce interesting audio snap, snapshots of it, which may be very exciting. Something to consider. Okay. 
So um, this is really exciting. It's really interesting to kind of think about the, the human cell atlas from, from a data perspective um, and from a computational angle. Um, I've been working on the project for, for nearly a year now, and it's been primarily kind of exposed and shared via the lens of the wet lab scientists and various different things. So it's an incredible opportunity here to, to listen um, from your perspective, from the data perspective. And I guess it's been noted a few times in, in your uh, presentations about the rapid evolution of technologies that you're dealing with alongside this expansive, awe-inspiring kind of, you know, um, level of data that you're dealing with. And I guess the question that I have just for all of you really is how do you, how do you manage that tension? How do you kind of, you know, think through this notion of future-proofing? Wow, I mean, that is a job and a half. I'd be really interested to to hear from maybe maybe Jacob, if you could give me a sense of, of how you kind of you know, manage that tension between the rapid evolution of technologies, the constant changing landscape, and the sheer volume of ever increasing data that you're dealing with as projects evolve and develop. Well, uh, changing, rapidly changing technologies is a problem, not, not just in the HCA, but all software development. Um, if you do take a few months out or if it's longer out of the flow of developing tech, you are you do get quite lost and there's a feeling of being overwhelmed that there's too much new things to learn. So it, it's quite difficult to keep up to constantly learn. But I, I think it's not it, it, the, the importance is just to remember that you you do have the knowledge required, the existing knowledge required to learn, and you can always learn new skills. And it's not, it's not, it, it's not completely an overwhelming task to keep up with the pace. It's just, it, it seems so, but as long as you take it piecemeal and learn little bits by little bits, it it, it works out in the end. That's really interesting. Way as a data wrangler, have you got a thought on this? Yeah, I think similar to Jacob, we're always trying to figure out what the new most used technology is going to be. We sort of see you know, trends in the papers that we get. There's a big upward trend in a specific technology and we're thinking, oh, maybe that's the one that we should prioritize most because far more data will be coming in in that specific format. That's how we need to adapt our metadata schema to fix that. So we, we, we try and do a bit of contemplative predicting of the future to, to make life easy for ourselves, but also to make sure we get out the bulk of the useful data out to our community um, as, as quickly and as accurately as we can. Yeah. Brilliant. That's great. Um, I'm conscious that it's half one and we've um, had our hour. Um, you're all very welcome to join the Discord channel. If anybody wanted to ask a question outside of this forum, is there um, anything that you can share with me by way of a contact um, to drop into the Discord for any maker jammers moving forward? I, I can drop my email and I'm also on the Discord channel. Great, okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and we've got Jacob sharing his email there, which I'll, which I'll grab before we leave. Without further ado, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you all for joining us on this lunchtime. Thank you to our speakers. You've been fascinating to listen to. Thank you, Claire, um, for, for kind of supporting the, the, um, the logistics and putting this together. And Bryony, um, really pleased to have had you all here today. And I will let you go and have some food and a cup of tea. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye.